Our second student talk is uh, Hiromo Uno, who is currently a PhD student at UC Berkeley in the laboratory of Mary Power. And Hiromi got her BS and MS degrees from Kyoto University in Japan. And she says she loves natural history. And I saw her give a talk uh, at the SFS meeting in Portland, and it was uh, a really, I thought, a really great way that she integrated natural history with some um, really fascinating investigations into uh, the way that uh, surrounding ecosystems feed the stream and vice versa, what we call trophic subsidies. So her talk is Trophic subsidies from the main stem to tributaries by migratory mayflies is strengthened by the main stem thermal variations. All right, welcome, Hiromi. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Mark. Um, my study today, what, what I'm going to talk about is about <laughs> is um, our, my dissertation project. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work in a very natural system in the headwater of the U River in the Angel Coast Range Reserve in California. And what I'm documenting is how dynamically animals and insects and fish are moving around in the river network and how important they are in the species interactions. So today's my talk. The main character is this mayflies. <laughs> I know many of you look at the nymphs and larvae, but not many of you probably have paid too much attention to this adult. But actually, their movement is extremely important in the food web that I'm going to show about. OK, so natural streams are very heterogeneous and beautiful. And there are many riparian forests along the river. There are rivers and pools, and there are small streams and large rivers, and they are all connected. However, this is a real world in California, and we are concerned about the loss of the heterogeneity and also habitat connectivities. And today's my talk is about how important spatial heterogeneity is, and I especially focus on this. Uh, River network scale heterogeneity and the segment scale reach scale heterogeneity. Okay, so as I told you, I'm working in the Northern California, this under coast range river in the Eagle River. A natural river actually is not linear system, but has a lot, a lot of small tributaries that flow into a big river and forming this network structures. And small creeks are not just a small, small types of the big river, but have very different habitats. Usually small tributaries are shaded by riparian forests, and there are less algae, but there are a lot of leaves that support the food web. While the mainstream river gets a lot of sunshine, lots of algae growing, and insects, and lots of insects. And between these habitats, actually, there are many animals that are moving around. As you know, there are many anadromous fish that go between the ocean and the rivers, like steelhead, lampreys, and also these like, uh, amphibians, such as yellowhead frogs, are known to migrate between the mainstem and the tributaries. They grow uh, adults live in the forest near the head, small tributaries, and then adults go down to the main stem to spawn. Tadpoles grow in the main stem eating algae, and then after metamorphosis, the frogs go back to the tributaries, right? And then what I want have discovered is that actually mayfly, some kinds of aquatic insects, also migrate in the river network. This species, Ephemeria macrota, this is a very common species in the distributed all around California. And what I've discovered is actually this species migrate between the main stem and the tributaries. This is the life cycle of ephemeral macrotor that I have discovered. This ephemeral macrotor grow up 
grow up in this very old, in this very wide productive mainstream as news. And you see these news in the wide mainstream. However, actually these main flies after they emerge, they all find the small tributaries. So all these adults were only found in these small tributaries, and then after females jump into the tributaries and lay their eggs and they die. And these eggs hatch in the small tributaries in December, January, and then the babies float down and the nymphs live here. So let me describe their life cycle with pictures. This is what happens in the small tributaries. These small dots are all adult ephemeral character. They fly only in dusk for about 30 minutes from 8.30 to 9 in June and July. And then all, they are actually all female and they have eggs at the tip of their abdomen and they jump into the ripples. And after that, what, this is how the creek look like. They, what is this? These white things actually are all dead mayflies. This Ephraim character, however, can never be found in the small tributary as nymphs. And after their massive migrations, the, this is how the bed of the creek look like. They are all egg mass of Ephraim character. So I looked around the distribution of both of the nymphs and the adult stages, and yellow line is the distribution of the nymphs or main stem of the river. However, the distribution of adults are linked to these tributaries. So they are showing the complete migrations between the main stem and the tributaries, and actually their migration is very cryptic. Because when we were paying only attention to nymphs, there is things living only in the main stem, because the life stage that they are in the tributaries are just eggs and very, very tiny nymphs, about 200 microns. So if you are looking at the nymphs, you may think they are distributed in the main stem, but actually the tributaries is very important habitat for them as well. OK. So I want to talk about how it is important in the food web. And as I told you, the main stem and the tributaries in the river have very distinct uh, um, environment. And when the small tributaries flow into the main stem, many animals can take advantage of the habitat difference. And when you think about the food webs, the main source of the food web is very different. In this productive habitat in the main stem, there are lots of algae growing and many insects eat those algae, and then the insects that emerge from the river even feed the riparian predators like bats, birds, and lizards, and fish are eating a lot of insects. While in small creeks, food webs in the small creeks rely largely on the riparian forest productivity. So there are lots of small fish in the tributary, but many of these fish are considered to be eating those riparian insects. And what the, this inferior curator actually is doing is to add this food source pass. Because they grow up in the productive main stem, migrate as adults, and then go to small tributaries and die, throughout their life cycle, actually they are transporting a lot of, lot of energy resources from the productive main stem to the productive tributaries. So this Ephraim character may be making the predators in small tributaries happy. So I looked around. <laughs> they, in fact, just very happy. <laughs> Look at this. This fish is so fat. <laughs> and those spiders, they're even annoyed by these, you know, massive mayflies. And of course, water storagers, salamanders, they are all crazy eating mayflies there. So I looked at the gut contents of the steelhead trout in the tributaries. And this red one is the Ethereum Aculata adult. You can see so much of the, their gut contents actually is consist of this Ethereum Aculata migratory mayfly adult. So this might be a very important food source. So I 
estimated how many mayflies are jumping into the creek. And it ended up about 4,000 individuals of mayflies actually were jumping into the square meter every day from June to July. And that is huge amount. This is the equivalent to 2.4 gram in dry mass, which is so much more than the aquatic insect nymphs, terrestrial insects, and even leaf litter. You can see how much this is. And when you calculate the density, uh, look at the density of steelhead trout, and calculate how many mayflies, how much mayflies are supplying for each fish, and then that means calculate to 1.5 gram of mayflies are viable for each fish every day. This is a huge amount. And especially, this happens from June to July, which is actually a critical growth period for steelhead trout area in small tributaries. So I conducted field, ma field manipulative experiment to evaluate the effect of these mayfly migrations. So I conducted, uh, compare, to compare the um, effect of this ephemeral maculata migratory mayfly and terrestrial subsidy that has been considered as a primary source for tributary fish, I manipulated the presence and absence of terrestrial subsidy and the presence and absence of immaculate subsidy and compare the growth rate of juveniles fish. So I manipulate, uh, I said that this is one of the picture of the one, uh, the, my study site. Each site has fence upstream and downstream that can each site contain one leaf from and one adjacent pool. Uh, we manipulated the density of fish at 0.6 individuals per square meter per day, uh, square meter as natural density. And then we manipulated terrestrial subsidy with this plastic group. With plastic group, there was no terrestrial subsidy, and without, uh, terrestrial, uh, without the loop, there were plus terrestrial subsidy. And then we manipulated the ephemeral macular migratory mayfly subsidy with drift net. Because all these mayflies actually jump into a reef hole, but not pool, we set the drift net at downstream between the reef and pool and captured all the mayflies. And then after we catch, we measure how much there was and then we distributed them back to the sites. And we measure the body size of steelhead juveniles before and after the mayfly migration period. And then this is the result. These left two boxes are with ephemeral maculator, and these are without ephemeral maculator. What you see here, actually, is that ephemeral maculator may triple the growth of juvenile steelhead trout in the tributaries, which is a huge impact. And actually, although terrestrial subsidy has been considered as primary food source, in my experiment, actually, there was no effect. I don't, I don't say terrestrial subsidy is not important, because terrestrial subsidy lasts for year round, while if I'm a drug subsidy only for one month. However, this critical, uh, this subsidy during the, June, the critical growth period in summer is very important for fish. And this is the growth rate, body size of uh, steelhead trout in, across the year. And you can see after they, they are hatched, they grow very rapidly in June and July. And then the body size don't grow much. So, and the ephemeral subsidy occurs in this growing period. So the co-occurrence of this migratory steelhead juveniles and the migratory mayflies in small tributaries is extremely important for the salmonids to sustain in these deeper networks. And especially this migratory pattern is important in California because California is located at the southern border of the state of America in the salmonid distribution. And the rivers are warming because of the you know, deforestation and water withdrawal and everything. And uh, many steelhead trout in rivers in California are heat stressed. In fact, in our system, the water temperature gets up to 25 degrees in the mainstem, the surface. 
while the tributary water stays cool because of the groundwater contribution. So reflecting that, the number of fish when we looked at it, in the main stem, there are a lot of like, um, warm adaptive fish and even uh, invasive species such as roach, sticklebacks, they are good, but sacrament pike minors. While in the small tributaries, there are lots of cool adaptive native fish, like steelhead trout and then salamanders. So, originally, there are lots of fish in everywhere. However, the mainstream water is getting more and more heat stressed now. So, the distribution and habitat of these cool adaptive predators are getting more and more restricted to small these tributaries. However, usually they are very food limited. But because this may try carry all resource from too warm place to cool but food limited place, these mayflies are keeping these steelhead juveniles happy. So this resource transportation to summer refugee by mayflies may back further adaptation of these steelhead in the warming river networks in California and can be very important food source for them. So I'm interested in, I just introduced this movement of mayflies, but I'm also interested in the movement of fish and also nematodes associated with this mayflies. Because we have to understand how the fish get to the tributaries, because it is important that the fish need to get into the tributaries. And I have been realizing that there are lots of barriers and constrictions for fish to get into the tributaries. For example, I see a lot of actually um, color birds and artificial stuff. And also I realized uh, we need uh, sufficient amount of flood um, for the adult steelhead to go from the main stem to the small tributaries. Because in many cases, there are a lot of some like, additional gap at the mouth of the tributaries. And sometimes in summer, juveniles steelhead cannot go from the main stem to tributaries when the water is too dry and sometimes the tributary mouth dries up. So I'm interested in that as well, but I will save that for next time. <laughs> and today I want to add one more dimension. I just talked about this mainstream and tributary river network structure. But what I'm finding now is this mainstream habitat heterogeneity is also related to this mainstream tributary interactions. <coughs> How? So in the main stem, in the river, there is huge amount of summer heterogeneity. Because the water level is low, the, the flowing water body is about 20 degrees, but when, where the water is not flowing, the water temperature is much higher. So there is a huge amount of special heterogeneity in the water temperature. And what does it cause? For mayflies, it is known that their emergence timing is related to the water temperature. And for this ephemeral macrotor, also, I found that they emerge earlier at warmer temperatures. So that means when there is special heterogeneity in the water temperature, the emergence timing of mayflies are also asynchronized by the special heterogeneity in the temperature. So perhaps this is a hypothesis. When there is special heterogeneity in the water temperature, the timing of the mayfly emergence may be asynchronized by the habitat. And because mayflies come out from different places from different timing, as a, and as a whole, the mayfly subsidy may long, last for longer. And when there is the heterogeneity is lost, all the mayflies emerge at the same time because the water temperature is constant. And then all the mayflies come out in a very short time, and you know the subsidy may last for a shorter time. And that is a huge issue for the fish that's waiting for the mayflies, because they cannot eat all the fish at, in short time. So this what makes them heterogeneity might be important for the tropical interactions. So I conducted a few experiments, and I layered the mayflies in the different part of the river with flow-through buckets, and looked at the emergence timings. And this is what I discovered. Y-axis is the number of ephemeral that emerged. 
and x axis is a date. And as you can see, main flights emerge earlier from warmer area. However, they emerge later in the cooler area, as we predicted. And at each place's location, their emergence lasted only for two weeks. However, because their emergence timing is asynchronized, entirely, actually, the Mayfly emergence lasted for one month from early June to early July. And actually, this single point um, was the same as the period that we naturally observe the other mayflies in the tributaries. And we also looked at the stable, uh, sulfur stabilized glaciers in the NIMS and convinced so that the ice stabilized uh, sulfur glacier is lower, uh, down, oh, lower downstream and higher upstream because of the difference in the red dots. And reflecting that, adult stabilized glacier was actually also low in the early seed arrivals. And their signature was higher for the late arrivals, indicating that the early arrivals came from warmer main downstream habitat. So all this data show that the spatial heterogeneity is causing the prolonged subsidy of the mayflies. And so this next summer, I'm planning to conduct field experiments adding mayflies at different timings and different durations um, for over four weeks, two weeks, and eight weeks and see how that affects on the fish. Okay, this is the end of my talk. Um, the river is very heterogeneous. This is, looks very nice. And there should be some meanings, and you know, and this spatial heterogeneity may be making the trophic interactions very efficient. And when the trophic um, efficiency is higher, we can support more fish with same amount of the productivity. So this is very important to understand the relationship of this spatial heterogeneity and the trophic interactions in the river. Thank you very much. This is uh, supported by many other students.